Hello and greetings of peace. What are the forces behind globalization? And can we, can we identify the factors and principles that govern the process of globalization? Two grand theories emerged in the 20th century to try to answer those questions. The first one focused on conversions of world cultures um, as the main pattern that govern globalization. They have argued, um, those who advance this theory have argued that um, all cultures have to go through the path that traversed by European culture and cultures towards modernization. And so uh, Europe became the model, the benchmark for the entire uh, global society to follow if they want to achieve uh, uh, modern conditions that enjoyed by European societies. The other uh, theory um, made the opposite argument by, by insisting that the uh, future of globalization and perhaps as well the past has uh, uh, been uh, the result of clash of civilizations. And so uh, we have the convergence of, culture, of cultures and the clash of civilizations as two grand theories attempting to answer those questions. I would like to uh, reflect on those uh, uh, arguments made by these two theories and uh, hopefully out of that we could really come up with some, uh, um, some conclusions that could help us uh, dispel some of the mystery around why do we uh, come to this global moment in the history of humanity and where do we go from there. So uh, let me first begin with the conversions theory and focusing on the arguments that uh, were advanced by um, advanced by uh, modernization theorists. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to share with you again the definition I suggested um, um, of globalization. So. The definition here is that globalization is the gradual convergence of public ideals and social experiences across world cultures, um, which is again shared with the conversion theory, the notion of convergence, but the difference is that while this definition focuses on public ideals, that's to say the values that govern public life, and on um, shared experiences and exchange of experiences. The other one uh, provides, uh, as I said, Europe as the final model for anyone who would like to advance and um, uh, talks about, as we'll see shortly, about a total cultural uh, em uh, embracing of, of, uh, of European culture. So convergence, according to modernization theory, which was advanced by a number of scholars around the middle of the 20th century, uh, including uh, scholars like uh, Seymour Lipset, um, David Apter, um, Walt Rostow, and Daniel Lerner. These were scholars who benefited from the sociological work of Talcott Parson, uh, an American sociologist who had uh, ideas um, about the, the economy, the role of the economy and of secularization, and they have really embraced those as aspects. So for, for uh, people, for, for societies to develop, they have to embrace uh, a liberalization policy toward the economy. They have to focus on the economic activities and having Liberal, liberalized economy. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see shortly what that means. And the other uh, element that has been uh, emphasized is social secularization. So uh, religion has to be marginalized, has to, has to be pushed to the side uh, because it's an obstacle in the, in the way of, of, of modernization and progress. 
uh, in fact, uh, the, um, the disdain of religion was very thorough. Let me share with you this quotation from Daniel Lerner. Uh, he um, presented uh, in his uh, um, The Passing of Traditional Society, presented a very uh, advanced uh, um, call for, for secular, social secularization. And uh, had a lot of pleasure of noting that, well, Islam is no more important in the life of the Egyptian society, which was he studying and, and other uh, perhaps Muslim societies. Uh, so as you could see here, religion is seen by, by um, learner as an obstacle to be avoided <clears throat> and to be, to be uh, um, you know, uh, Pushed aside. Now that takes us to the more uh, refined account of conversions that emerged in the 1989 in a, an article that was written by uh, Francis Fukuyama um, under the title of The End of History. This uh, article was later on uh, expanded into a full fledged book uh, titled The End of History and The Last Man. In this uh, book, uh, um, Fukuyama um, celebrated the triumph of, of liberalism over uh, communism. Um, this, uh, this article, as I pointed out, in, was published in 1989, which was the year in which the Soviet Union collapsed. And so that was a, a signal for Fukuyama then that this is really the end of history. And by that, uh, he adopted the notion advanced by Hegel, end of history, meaning the end of the evolution of political institutions into the liberal democratic institution. Um, and uh, uh, in that book also, um, um, Fukuyama talked about the psychological grounding of that, of that uh, end of history. So what will happen after we have now a, a one global society that will live under liberal democracy and liberalism is the main ideology that defeated all other ideologies. He uh, thought that uh, for that to happen, then uh, there must be some sort of tamming or restraint of uh, human uh, uh, desire to achieve uh, glory and supremacy. Um, and so um, here is where we have this notion of the last man. The last man is a man or a human being uh, with, the, with, the, with the more moderate ambition and is not like uh, his predecessor who, who opted for glory and, of course, achieving glory. Uh, probably the most important aspect of that was this political and military struggle struggle between uh, uh, tribes and, and, and nations. Now, um, uh, Fukuyama, of course, depended heavily on the writings of Hegel in advancing his theory, because Hegel uh, made two similar arguments. Uh, he argued that the history of, of humanity is the history of a struggle for freedom. People struggle for freedom, to achieve freedom, and so that explains what happened throughout history. We move from a society where one person is a free, the monarch, to society, to societies where the uh, few are free, as to say, the political elites or the aristocrats, uh, and finally, into everyone is free, and that is the democratic society. Um, so that was part of the argument of Hegel. The other part about, of course, human psychology that explains why people sought freedom and uh, sought uh, to uh, advance their political conditions, having to do with an important psychological element, which is the pursuit of recognition. People desire to be recognized, and that recognition can take a th a three different forms, either uh, self-worth, so people would like to be respected because they value themselves, or the second form would be this, the pursuit of glory. People would like to uh, excel others, and the glory and supremacy 
would be part of their ambition, or uh, the, the third form, which is equal dignity, which, which is the form that is ensured through democracy. Now, what I would like to do now is to really look into the assumptions behind those affirmations, beginning with uh, the question of uh, the point that was put by, by um, Fukuyama, that um, really we have now the triumph of liberalism. Now, the assumption is that we, you know, 1990s, uh, we were uh, living in a, a liberal society, as the assumption is that we are still living in liberal society. But this is really not true. What happened is that by the 19, late 1970s, that was the time of the triumph of new liberalism that has even advanced even more as the 21st century uh, progressed uh, through the uh, through our current moment. Uh, I don't want to really to delve deeply into that question, but I would like to share with you this this table that will show you how classical liberalism is different from new liberalism. That really is hardly to say these are the same thing. So um, in the area of economics, you know, liberalism. Uh, always um, um, put priority on social justice, at least in theory. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure in practice things could, could look different. But neoliberalism really put all the emphasis on uh, unregulated uh, capital. So the, the, the key to progress and the human prosperity and peace is uh, unrestrained capital. So um, as you can tell, these are two different views of, of society and politics. The same thing with, the, with regard to the priority, uh, either, either democracy or, or, or oligarchy. It seems now, I mean, even today, we can see very clearly that new liberalism has pushed toward an oligarchical society, even in the West, let alone in the developing countries where it reigned for a long time before uh, and was able to create uh, oligarchy, as we'll see in subsequent lectures before that, that push came back to Western societies. The emphasis of international law in, um, in uh, liberalism, while the emphasis on bilateral negotiation, uh, which always uh, privileged the powerful. So when a weak uh, country negotiates with a powerful country, we know exactly who can impose the terms of, of that agreement. Um, again, uh, liberalism emphasizes secular state, not secular uh, society, while neoliberalism keep pushing toward uh, a very uh, secularized society where religion really has no place. And in fact, it, it, it has been pushing to, you know, uh, certain uh, values that are contr very contrary to, to liberal values, etc. Uh, another assumption that I would like to challenge is that, well, um, um, you know, the, uh, the, it is possible for us to change human nature and make people not interested in, um, uh, in advancing their own self-interest or seeking supremacy. Uh, um, so that is um, clearly there's no sign that the ambition has slowed down. In fact, we can see that there's more push toward supremacy today in the world, particularly on the part of new, new, new liberals. But, but in fact, beyond that, as I, would, I, I have tried to show in this, in this uh, diagram, um, trying to suppress uh, the desire to excel and achieve uh, higher conditions is not desirable because the only way to achieve that is to impose a tyrannical uh, system. So no conflict because conflict is part of a human society. You can't do away with conflict. The secret or the, 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 the better path is to have constructive conflict by institutionalizing that conflict and by allowing different people uh, in society to uh, to be able to have their own say and try to persuade others 
to to adopt one policy or the other. And so uh, clearly, um, the, um, the the notion that uh, we could um, could could uh, really achieve um, <clears throat> um, sort of um, constrain completely human nature is neither possible nor desirable, and therefore we have to seek a different path. Um, and uh, so, what is that path? And that's probably I have to uh, um, come back to it at the later point. But for now, let us come back to uh, an important argument uh, that has been made by Fukuyama. Um, again, uh, um, borrowing from um, Hegel. Uh, Hegel uh, have, have argued that uh, in terms of the history of, of Europe in particular, I mean, of course, he did not talk about Europe, but, but the example he's, he used uh, was very, very true in, in, in the European society, is that there were two type of ethos that led into, into the progress of, of European society. One is what he called the warrior ethos, courage. And, and so people... Um, uh, who have the courage uh, or who wanted to really to excel uh, uh, follow that that uh, path by becoming warriors fighting for supremacy on the European continent and of course to some extent this is really a general human human uh, uh, proclivity you, we could find this kind of of behavior um, throughout the human history so um, it is true that this is really one, one, uh, one, one path that we could observe. The other path is what he called the, uh, the work ethics. Work ethics was another path for a human to excel and to, to achieve supremacy. And uh, Hegel pointed, uh, of course, Fukuyama, I should say, uh, used the uh, Max Weber uh, thesis of the Protestant ethic to, to talk about this and hence this, this slide that we see here, the Protestant ethic. What is the Protestant ethic that was at, you know, advocated or argued by Weber? Uh, it has a number of, of, of qualities like frugality, not to um, really seek uh, expensive uh, uh, and, and, and uh, very extravagant uh, and lavish spending to have self-discipline, to discipline oneself um, ethically, not to, um, uh, not to exceed um, their uh, sphere of, of right and obligations, to be honest um, in, in life, including in trade, not to deceive people because uh, that is reflected in trade. When people are honest, then those who are honest tend to be a better trader and bitter uh, marketers. And then the aversion to extravagance. So yes, you, you, um, you seek to, in to increase your wealth, but not use that wealth on yourself and on the people who you care about, but to use it to even provide uh, new um, economic ventures so that you can create job opportunities and, and benefit other people. Uh, the interesting thing about this element of the ethics that brought Europe into its uh, uh, advanced economic stage is that th that ethic was grounded in religion. So it was religion and this religious reformation of European society that made both the secular state and uh, because uh, and and uh, you know the economics activities became really quite vibrant. Um, and the secular state, uh, you, you may, you, you know, was, was based on the very transcendental values that was advanced by the reformist, uh, religious reformist, values like equal, equality of people or people are equal. Um, Luther, Luther, Luther put it in the notion of we, uh, we are all priests, so you, there is no priestly class. To be, to be set above and, and over society. Every member of society should have the same access to the scriptures. 
this concept became in, in, ingrained in the psyche of European uh, society and people so, sought uh, equality rather than supremacy, um, at least for a while, <laughs> as long as they were struggling to get rid of themselves from, uh, from the monarchs uh, that controlled their lives and from the church that set like a social hierarchy and, and consider certain individuals are more worthy of the uh, um, of the transcendental knowledge and and benefits <laughs> um, so but, but then modernization theory did the opposite rather than advocating that developing society should undertake reform in terms of cultural reform based on their basic values they have pushed to eliminate religion completely and hence making a uh, change in those societies even uh, impossible. So um, that uh, uh, leads us to talk about this, the second grand theory, the clash of civilization, civilizations, which was advanced by, uh, uh, by Huntington, Samuel Huntington, around the same time uh, Fukuyama made his argument for the triumph of liberalism, uh, but it was really uh, a triumph of neoliberalism rather, th rather than liberalism. But Huntington, um, uh, who, who interestingly was an advocate of convergence, all of a sudden in the early 90s decided that convergence is no more, and he uh, talked about a clash of uh, civilizations um, by that he meant that with the end of ideology, so, uh, so, so he agreed with Fukuyama that uh, ideology is no more. And in, many, in, in fact, uh, Huntington is, uh, um, is the uh, professor at, at Harvard who also taught Fukuyama. Um, so he agreed with Fukuyama that um, ideology is no more. But he came to a different conclusion that now conflict will continue, but this conflict would be among uh, not ideological states, but among civilizations and cultures. Um, a very, very surprising conclusion, um, but uh, one would ask, what is the foundation of that claim? Um, so I'll come shortly to, to outline the main claims or evidence that presented by Huntington to advance this argument. But he said, well, uh, the world now will become divided into civilizations. And he had identified a number of civilizations. Here's a list of civilizations he suggested are going to in, in, engage in, in conflict. Uh, the Western civilization, Confucian, um, and by that he meant the, 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 uh, the uh, religion that is predominant in China, uh, the Japanese, the Islamic, the Hindu, the Slavic Orthodox, you know, Russia and uh, in particular Latin America. Uh, um, of course, he didn't talk about Catholic, but definitely that's what he has in mind. And, and he said possibly African civilization, so that Africa to de will develop into a civilization, and all these civilizations will, will vie for supremacy and engage in endless clashes for supremacy. Now, out of all of them, he did not really view all these civilizations on equal, on equal bar, but he thought maybe Confucian and Islamic civilizations would be the, 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 the more um, hostile to Western civilization, uh, and hence they could be the future enemies. Um, and he has some recipe how to deal with that, with that enemy. Um, um, but then you may ask, what are the grounds of such far-fledged claims? Now, one, one uh, one argument was, well, uh, with the end of ideology, people will not be fighting based on ideology, but 
they will will, will fight on on the basis of the identity they care about more after ideology which is their culture and their religion and culture and religion became the the dividing line between uh, uh, nations or between powers and so for him civilizational fault lines as he called them will replace uh, theological boundaries so that was one ground for his argument the second one has to do with the long uh, um, struggle between Europe and the Islamic world uh, and so that for him was uh, a clue to say well then uh, the future would be exactly the same thing like the past um, so for he argued that for 1300 years uh, uh, almost 13 centuries Europe and Muslim countries were engaged in a, in a constant war. And so with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of ideology, then he, he assumed that that has to be uh, resumed. Um, even though the, the world was changing, uh, the Muslim world was changing, um, uh, but that didn't matter for Huntington. Finally, the revival of, of religious sentiments um, all over the world, including in the West. He realized that Western people now are more uh, keen to identify or to search for religious, you know, worldview. And he confused that with the desire to go back into conflict with people of different religions. Now, definitely within all societies, you might find a group of people Usually these are the tiny minority, fringe groups often, who really entertain this, this kind of thinking. But to generalize from the fringe to the mainstream uh, uh, cultures and societies were, was um, really an uncalled for um, uh, conclusion. And, and I would argue that the reason for, for his conclusion is that uh, first of all, he has understood human history um, through his reading to Western history. And this is not the fault of Huntington alone. This is a general, a general trait by many sociologists and psychologists um, and social scientists in general that they generalize from the European experience into the global experience, and this is a big mistake, as we'll see in subsequent uh, lectures in this series um, focusing on globalization. Uh, Europe is not a typical uh, example of how the rest of the world and, and previous civilizations uh, um, dealt with their own internal uh, um, issues. Um, this is a limited observation, uh, and conclusions from limited uh, observations often lead into a distorted uh, views of the past. Um, and that's why we saw in the early, in the first lecture, how uh, Carol Jespers urged his, his, you know, the scholars of his time, uh, I'm talking about the late 1950s, that they should really go beyond European history to understand world history and to see Europe as part of a, of a, of, of a larger uh, cultures and civilizations that uh, contributed to the rise of current European and or Western uh, civilization. Um, so uh, this is definitely a problem for, for, for us. Uh, when uh, uh, there is a when you when you look at Europe as the only model for progress and development, when you ignore other civilizations that contributed even to the rise of Europe, how did Europe rise from a from a, it's a feudal system with lack of knowledge into a modernity? That's something we'll focus on again in a separate uh, discussion, but. Europe depended greatly on previous civilizations, particularly on the Islamic civilization itself, to gain, you know, you know, advancement in science, technology, 
and in even philosophy. Uh, and uh, I would like to show later that while many European uh, uh, thinkers think that the, original, uh, the origin of their thought is in the Greek philosophy, I would like to argue this is really a misconception. Um, the moral system that, that was responsible for the rise of Europe and the basic ideas about humanity and society and the world were developed within the Islamic civilization. But that is to be left for another discussion. Uh, for now, let me um, uh, look at one concerning aspect of Huntington thought, which eventually fed into the current far-right ideology. So the far-right ideology really could be found clearly in the work of Huntington, The Clash of Civilizations, and more so in, in, in another book he authored in the early... Um, uh, 21st century, in the first decade, in 2004, he published a book called Who Are We? Talking about the American experience and insisting that what made people Americans is not only their shared principles and values, but also their culture. And he's talking about European culture and their ethnic background. My goodness, that was quite interesting to see from someone like Huntington, who was early on pushing toward convergence and, and having a global society. And here we have a new person emerging in his last two books, um, particularly the last one, Who Are We?, about the American identity uh, and trying to frame this identity in four factors, including the ethnic uh, uh, factor. So he was not happy that the American society was becoming a multi-ethnic society. And that's exactly what the far right has been doing to try to, to turn the clock back. But, but that is a tall order because you cannot reverse history. You can advance history, but you can't reverse it. Uh, another, another concerning, so you see here how he, uh, in, this, in this slide, we could see how he is blaming Islam, uh, saying that the problem is, uh, he, he doesn't say the problem as being, you know, Islamic fundamentalism, but in fact, Islam itself. And that's really also a uh, point to my earlier uh, um, argument that if you don't understand anything before the Enlightenment, or for that matter, the, the Reformation, if you don't understand how the Reformation came about and how the Enlightenment, Enlightenment came about in Europe, then really you cannot make any uh, a good understanding of, of, of Islam and how it relates to uh, contemporary, contemporary society. Uh, and so to blame even Islam and not, the, not uh, certain Muslims or certain um, uh, narrow-minded Muslims is a quite a problem and this is sort of seeding the, uh, um, you know, um, putting the seeds of hatred and of conflict between two huge uh, um, uh, group of people. Um, the, the, uh, the, then it is not only that he, he did not really appreciate uh, the impact of Islam, and he confused uh, current nihilistic fund Islamic fundamentalism uh, to Islam, or for that matter, for, Islam, for Muslim societies, he has shown the anti-democratic, uh, uh, not only tendency, but really position. He now, he now um, um, stands in opposition for expansion of democracy beyond the Western borders. Because he argued that in the rest of the world, when people become democratic, rather than, than promoting Western cultures, now they would, would promote their own cultures. Um, what is wrong with that? Um, what's wrong with that is this is a very Euro Eurocentric look at the world. So for the world to be peaceful, the, for the world to be trusted, for the world to be considered as a part of the, uh, of the free world, then it has to become exactly, it has to mimic uh, European society and mimicking really would not lead anyone to, to progress. Of course, 
deep in this conception is this mistrust of diversity and, and pluralism. Uh, this is an old European uh, problem. Uh, we know that Europe throughout the history has tried to impose one culture, one language, and one religion whenever uh, the monarchs and the uh, whoever hold power uh, uh, could do that. Uh, so in France, you know, the French language was, was imposed on many people. The same thing in, uh, in other parts of Europe. Uh, this is this, this Eurocentric uh, view of the world that for the world to be peaceful, it has to be exactly uh, following the same culture, which is really a tall order. But because culture is not, if it, it, it is not a, a, a constant thing, cultures keep changing. You can't have really one culture. American culture today is, is different than when it was in the, in the mid 50s or the 19th century or in the 15th century or the 10th century. Culture always changes. And you can't really make culture the benchmark for, 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 for other, other society to develop because we, what you are saying to develop, you have to submit to me. I have to have supremacy over you. I have to always teach you how to live and how to behave and that cannot be. That cannot be really the way to, to the future. Uh, the, 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 the way should be um, completely a different approach to, to society. And, and we'll talk about that approach in a later lecture. But this should be based on the global pluralism. We must really see the diversity of culture as something that we have to appreciate. What should we really push toward uh, is trying to, to, to advance a certain universal values that are part of the public discourse where people can come together in the public sphere, but their, their, their cultures, their private cultures cannot be really come, come under the control of any centralized power. That's so dangerous. And that would lead into, again, the return of the society of the masters and slaves that Hegel tried to show that this was the beginning but eventually work ethics trumped uh, the warrior ethics and, and the modern society was developed to, to, to try to respect knowledge and respect uh, debate and free exchange and, and uh, relegate power to, this, to, the, to the second level. This, this kind of model succeeded to great extent in, in national politics for short periods of times uh, but it's worthy to be to be examined and to be look, looked into. But to try to um, to advance a theory of international relations, international politics, that push toward the supremacy of one particular culture, um, which is changing all the time, which, as we'll see in in um, our subsequent discussion, it's a culture that is gradually losing the very values and elements that were responsible for its formation in the first place. Transcendental values are going down the drain today in modern society. They need to be uh, resuscitated. They need to be recovered in order for society to maintain its democratic institutions and its ability to have uh, uh, rule of law and mutual respect of all people. Uh, and uh, another problem we have seen uh, so far in some of those uh, accounts is that uh, there is a need really for us to understand world, world history and how, uh, how did we come to the, to the current point from the actual age civilizations um, around the uh, 500 um, BCE, uh, the, you know, there were a number of civilizations uh, across the globe. How did we move from that situation to a global moment that we have today? This is part of the need for us to look at world history and the patterns of development in world history. And that's what I'm going to do in our next lecture. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the ideas of, of Hegel 
Marx, the theory uh, of history and that were developed by these two important and influential for that matter uh, um, uh, philosophers. And we will look also, they advance both, they advance a unilinear view of history, which is really provide us with an incomplete picture. And we are going to look at two important philosophers of history, um, Spengler, or Spengler in, uh, uh, in Germany and uh, Toynbee uh, uh, in Britain. Both have really done uh, in, important uh, uh, work, they produce important work to help us understand uh, the growth of, of uh, uh, the evolution of, uh, of, of human history. And particularly, they both helped us to understand the connection between culture and civilization. These are not the same, although Huntington really used them in, um, as if they are the same. So for Huntington, cult uh, civilization is, a cul is culture writ uh, um, uh, huge, you know, it's a, which is his, his, his terms, meaning when you have the wider a uh, form of, of, of similarity of cultural traits, then you have civilization. This is not exactly what Spengler and Toynbee have, have shown by examining board history, and we'll look into that in our next uh, lecture, and I hope to see you again then.